I know Catholics venerate Mary and the saints in heaven, but what's the difference between worshiping God and honoring a saint? And where's that in the Bible? Many Protestants disapprove of the Catholic practice of venerating Mary and the saints. They see it as improper, even blasphemous, to render glory and honor to mere creatures. Catholics should respond to this concern with charity and a dose of the scriptural evidence in support of the veneration of the saints. Keep in mind that the objection to giving honor and glory to the saints is an old one, dating back to the early centuries of the church. For example, around the year AD 400, St. Augustine responded to this misunderstanding. He said, what is properly divine worship, which the Greeks call latria, and for which there is no word in Latin, both in doctrine and in practice, we give only to God. Accordingly, we never offer or require anyone to offer sacrifice to a martyr or to a holy soul or to any angel. Anyone falling into this error is instructed by doctrine, either in the way of correction or of caution. For holy beings themselves, whether saints or angels, refuse to accept what they know to be due to God alone. He wrote that in his work, Reply to Faustus the Manichaean. And he also referenced there, he alluded to Revelation 19 verse 10. The distinction that St. Augustine alluded to was between the Greek term latria, which is worship given to God alone, and dulia, which is giving honor and glory to God or his creatures. The Bible is clear that we can honor those saints who shine with God's own glory as the moon reflects the light of the sun. Consider these passages. In Matthew 6, verses 27 through 30, we read, And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O men of little faith? Notice there that Christ refers to the glory of Solomon. And listen to these words from Jesus in John 17, verses 20 through 23. Jesus said, I do not pray for these only, but also for those who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. The glory which thou hast given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and thou in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them even as thou hast loved me. That's a very important passage. Let's pause there for just a moment and think about what the Lord said. He said, I have given them, referring to his apostles, the glory that you, Father, have given me. So this is a very pointed expression of how God is not jealous or worried about some glory that is reflecting the way the moon reflects the light of the sun, the way some of his glory is reflecting from his servants, the saints. He's not worried that we're going to notice that glory and, and honor it because Christ himself said that he gave that glory to his disciples. In Romans 2 verses 4 through 11 we read, but by your hard and impenitent heart you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath and when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. For he will render to every man according to his works, to those who by patience in good works seek glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are factious and do not obey the truth, but obey wickedness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. In 1 Peter 1 verses 6 through 7 we read, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, which though perishable is tested by fire, 
may redound to praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Let's pause there for a moment and think about what St. Peter was saying. The people to whom he's speaking are the saints here on earth because in the New Testament, of course, we recognize that those in heaven are called saints, the holy ones. Those on earth who are followers of Christ are also referred to as saints or holy ones. And St. Peter is speaking here to those people who undergo suffering for the sake of Christ. And he says that this suffering and this following of Jesus is going to redound to their own glory and honor. And this is glory and honor not only in God's eyes, but in the eyes of all other people as well. And think about what St. Paul said in Romans 13, verses 1 through 7. He said, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, he who resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of him who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. He is the servant of God to execute his wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be subject, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For the same reason, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay all of them their dues, taxes to whom taxes are due, revenue to whom revenue is due, respect to whom respect is due, honor to whom honor is due. That passage sums up very well the essence of this Catholic teaching, which is, give honor to whom honor is due. And as the Bible shows, it is certainly due, by God's grace, to the Blessed Virgin Mary and the saints. I'd like to ask you to visualize in your mind's eye a throne room for a king. And imagine that you're going to see one king, and as you walk into this throne room, you know that his throne is at the far end of the room there. You can't really see him because the first thing you notice is that you're walking on beautiful carpet. And on the walls, there are hanging embroidered tapestries that are just brilliantly colored and beautiful scenes. And the room is filled with his courtiers. And as you walk through the room, you are more and more dazzled by how beautiful these men and women are. And they're wearing wonderful garments and jewels. And everything is radiating beauty and, and this sumptuousness. And the further into the throne room you go, the more radiantly beautiful everything around you is and you hear beautiful music and it's just this wonderful explosion of color and beauty. And then as you get all the way to the end of the throne room and you're now standing in the immediate presence of the king, you see him sitting on his throne arrayed in beautiful garments and wearing a crown and the entire scene is just overpowering with beauty. That king and that throne room is a way that may help you think about the way the Catholic Church looks at the way God glorifies his friends. After all, Jesus said that he gave his glory to his friends. This is the way Catholics approach the saints. We recognize that God's glory shines in them the way the sun in its light is reflected by the moon. Now imagine a second throne room. And this king is different because as you enter into this throne room, you recognize that you're walking on bare concrete and the walls are empty of any kind of adornments. And there's no music. There's no one else in the room. At the far end of the throne room, you can see the king and he's radiant and beautiful sitting on his throne. But there's nothing else in the room that might distract your attention for a moment other than the king himself. For many people, they sort of understand the communion of saints in this way. And for them, God is jealous and worried and fretting that somebody might look at the beauty of the Blessed Virgin Mary or one of the saints. And so they seek to have everything around this king completely muted or emptied of any kind of glory. I'm not saying that people necessarily do this consciously, 
but very often that's how they think when it comes to God glorifying his saints. Which throne room would you rather go into? Personally, I'd rather go into the throne room of the king who has beauty showered on all of his friends and he himself is that much more majestic because everything around him shares in that beauty and majesty. So as you're pondering this doctrine of the Catholic Church of giving glory and honor to Mary and the saints, just remember the Lord's words in John chapter 17, where he, as he was praying to the Father, he said, Father, I have given them the glory that you have given to me.